What's going on, everybody? Mr. Octagono here, and today we are back with the Three Minutes on the Clock podcast, Season 2, Episode 9. Today we have my 2020 NFL mock draft, 6.0, three rounds with trades. So a lot of stuff to cover. Also, remember, this is what I think will happen, not what I would do if I was the GM. So I don't agree with all these picks or trades. If you do want to see a mock draft of what I would do, I have those in my Discord. I'll leave the link in the description if you're interested. Not only would I have mock drafts there, but we also talk about the NFL draft and talk about the channel. And it's a good way to connect with me as well as other viewers. Also, I was going to do a Combine's winners and losers video this week, but I never got to it because I was sick. So instead of that, you'll see changes in today's mock draft reflected by how players did in the combine. Sort of like a guy like Denzel Mims. Probably a late second or early third rounder before the combine, but now he has moved into the first round. So you'll see changes like that to sort of give an ap- accurate representation of who I thought won and lost. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Just to make things clear, all the picks highlighted in blue are trade ups, and all the picks highlighted in green are trade downs. So let's start with the Bengals here at one. This is no surprise. They're going to pick Joe Burrow. Joe Burrow wants to be a Bengal. This media narrative of he does not want to play in Cincinnati is bogus. It's a lie. Joe Burrow is the best quarterback in this draft class. The Bengals will be making a mistake not to take him, and they're not stupid enough to not make this choice. Joe Burrow is the easy pick here. I think he's far and away the best QB prospect in this draft, and it's not that I think he's a generational talent. It's that I just don't think anyone's close to him in talent. I don't think Tua Tungvaluwa is near him, and Justin Herbert, Ethan, who is my QB2, is not that close to Burrow. So this is an easy pick for the Bengals. They won't mess it up. The second pick, the Washington Redskins have had rumors about maybe drafting a quarterback, maybe drafting a guy like Tua to give Dwayne Haskins some competition. The winner is your franchise quarterback, and the loser is traded for other assets down the line. I think that is a total lie because we saw it last year with Josh Rosen, but it I feel like it made sense. Rosen was not that good in year one in Arizona. To be fair, he wasn't surrounded with talent, but Kyler Murray was this transcendent quarterback in my opinion, and there was no one else. I mean, I guess looking at it now, Nick Bosa was could have been worth that pick, but I think at the time it made sense for Cardinals to do that. And looking at it now, I'm sure they're very happy that they went with Kyler Murray instead of Josh Rosen, but this is not the same scenario. I think Dwayne Haskins is a better player than Rosen. I think we need to see more, and I don't think two is an elite prospect to begin with, so that just does not make sense for the Redskins, and I think Chase Young is the easy pick here. Some say, oh, they don't need edge. They don't need defensive line. That's a lie. People are saying, oh, the Redskins have Jonathan Allen, Matt Ioannidis, Deron Payne. Those guys don't even play the same position as Chase Young, okay? Their edge rushers are Montez Sweat and Ryan Kerrigan. Sweat had a pretty good rookie year. He's set. Kerrigan, great player, but he's old. He's getting up there in age. He started to decline last year. So Chase Young can be the long-term replacement for Ryan Kerrigan, so it is fitting a need, and it's drafting the best player on the board. I don't know why the Redskins wouldn't do this, and I expect them to draft Chase Young. Even though as a Lions fan, I'm hoping these two of rumors to Washington are true. With the third pick, we do have a move here. The Los Angeles Chargers are going to move up and select Tua Tungvaluwa, the quarterback for Alabama. The Lions are moving down. They will receive pick six, along with the Chargers' second-round pick which is the 37th selection. They're also going to receive pick 72 along with a second rounder next year. So the Chargers, they don't even have to give up a first round pick in this deal to move up and draft Tua. Now, with them trading Russell Okun the other day for Trey Turner, that opens up a need at tackle. A lot of people think the Chargers are going to pick a tackle at six. Not only would they be trading up for a quarterback here, but they don't have a pick in day two. So... They won't have the opportunity until day three to get a tackle. So why does this make sense? Well, I think they're going to look at tackle and free agency. There is some talent 
in this class of a position, most notably a guy like Jack Conklin, I think could make sense for the Chargers. I think Conklin's going to ask for too much money, and I, he's a buyer beware. I don't think teams should look to pay him. What is he going to make? Four years, maybe around the 60 to $70 million range, which I think is absurd. I think that's way too much for him. But I think someone will do it, and I could see a team like the Chargers overbidding for a tackle because they want a guy like Tua or Justin Herbert in this draft. This all, On the bright side for the Chargers, though, not only do they get their franchise quarterback, but they get the guy I guess they want because they're going to have to move up for Tua. The Dolphins are picking him at five. And I think it's less and less likely the Dolphins are going to be the team to trade up. So if the Chargers really want Tua, I think they're going to have to be aggressive and trade up. I don't see the Dolphins being as aggressive as people think to move up for a guy like Tua. Because I think the Dolphins are more comfortable, it seems like now, with getting either Tua Tagovailoa or Justin Herbert. While Tua might be the guy they'd rather, I don't think they're really willing to move up for him, per se. With the fourth pick, the Giants. We got a surprise here. They're going to go Tristan Wirfs. Offensive tackle, Iowa. So they're not going to pick Isaiah Simmons. They're not going to pick Jeff Okuda. But instead, they're going to go with the freak athlete offensive lineman. Uh, Tristan Wirfs seems like a guy that Dave Gettleman would really like on his line. Wirfs can play guard and tackle. I assume if you're picking him in the top five, you're going to want him to play tackle. And there is an open hole at both tackle spots with the New York Giants. So I assume Tristan Wirfs will just plug right into one of those spots, probably left tackle. Be the Nate Solder replacement. Solder, or not Solder, Tristan Wirfs put up scary numbers at the combine. And I think he cemented himself on most boards as the number one tackle who will get picked. I think the question is where, and I think this is the earliest he could go. And I think this is where he will end up going. Number five, we got ourselves the Miami Dolphins. They're going to go with Justin Herbert, quarterback, Oregon. This is my first mock where the Dolphins are not the ones getting to a tongue of Iloa because, as I said, I don't think they really mind Justin Herbert. And while they'd prefer to, I don't think they're going to be aggressive in giving out assets to move up for him when instead they can get a guy in Herbert who they don't think is much worse without giving up, say, two seconds or another first-round pick to Detroit. And I think Herbert is a better prospect than Tua to begin with. I think Herbert has better physical tools. I think, obviously, the medical is there with Herbert, and there are more injury questions with Tua Tungavailoa. I think Herbert is a stronger arm. I think he's a little bit more mobile. It's just that Tua holds more intangibles and more awareness, more on-field IQ. But I think I like Justin Herbert. So maybe Herbert doesn't have all the technique you want that a guy like Tua does have. Herbert has more physical tools, and I think Herbert, because of that, is a better prospect. With the sixth pick, the Lions get Isaiah Simmons, linebacker Clemson. It'll either be him or Okuda to the Lions, I think. Personally, as a fan, I'd be happy with either player. If I were to choose, I would pick Isaiah Simmons, so this would make me very happy. Not only trading down and getting three day two picks within the next two seasons, but also getting the guy who, as this mock draft probably tells you, the Lions will pick it three. Isaiah Simmons is obviously a freak of nature. You saw the combine numbers he had. Insane vert jump. Insane 40. The versatility is insane. He can play safety in the box, in coverage, nickel corner, off-ball linebacker, edge rusher. He can do it all. And I think the only question is, is he too versatile? Does he not have a set position? Personally, I think he'll have a Derwin James-like role as an in-the-box type safety. So I think that's what you're getting with Isaiah Simmons, but also a guy who runs all over the field, can do pretty much anything on the defense, which is why I think this would be an absolute home run pick for the Lions. Pick seven, Panthers get Jeff Okuda, cornerback, Ohio State. Not a lot of mock drafts are having the Panthers getting Okuda because most have him gone here. And talent-wise, he should be gone here. Okuda's a top five talent without question in this draft. But based on the Chargers trading up, that has led to a domino effect. And Okuda is able to get stolen by the Panthers. This is an absolute steal of a selection. I understand they have bigger needs from corner. But in this situation, you got to go with the best player available, which is Jeffrey Okuda. Phenomenal cover skills. The combine was a little bit underwhelming, but still not removing him 
his status of being a top five talent. I think Carolina does need some corners. James Bradbury, he wants an absurd asking price. I saw something that said he wants like 15, 16 mil a year. That's top cornerback money. And I hate to break it to you, but James Bradbury is not a an elite level corner in this league. So I think moving on from him and getting a guy across Dante Jackson and Okuda actually does make a ton of sense for Carolina. I think if they're given this opportunity, they'll take it in a heartbeat. And then pick eight, Cardinals get C.D. Lamb, wide receiver, Oklahoma. Lamb is super explosive. He is phenomenal after the catch. I think Jerry Judy's a little bit better of a prospect than him, but still not a bad selection for Carolina, who's in need of a number one receiver, in need of a true playmaker and game changer on this offense, along with Kyler Murray. Personally, if I'm the Cardinals, I'm picking offensive line. I've said this since day one. I'd probably pick Mekhi Becton here, but... This is not a bad pick by any means. The Cardinals are in need of a number one receiver. And I mean, CeeDee Lamb isn't the best route runner, but if you get Larry Fitzgerald to mentor him, that could really turn CeeDee Lamb into a scary player. Not only a phenomenal route runner, but obviously a dynamic athlete and a playmaker after the catch. With the ninth pick, the Jaguars are going to get Derek Brown, interior defensive lineman from Auburn. And this is another one of those domino effects. Because of the Chargers trade-up, you have differences in this draft and more talented players like Jeff Okuda and now Derek Brown falling. I'm not as high on Brown as others. A lot of people have him in the top five of their boards. I don't. I just think Derek Brown's value to today's game is not as much as a guy that like maybe Isaiah Simmons brings. But nonetheless, I do think this is a good pick for the Jags. I've been having them get Javon Kinlaw a lot in my recent mocks, and if Brown is gone, Kinlaw could still be the pick here, but most scouts do have Derek Brown ranked higher than Javon Kinlaw at the position, so I do think that is where the Jaguars would end up going with. Getting an elite run stuffer to add to this already really talented front seven could be big for them, so watch out for Jaguars' defense. Saxonville 2.0 is on the horizon. And let me just tell you, the Jaguars are going to continue to build defense in this draft. And you'll see early in for this first round what I mean. Pick 10, Mekhi Becton, offensive tackle Louisville to the Cleveland Browns. I think it's no secret that their offensive line is not good. They are in need of a franchise tackle. They have not had one since Joe Thomas retired a few years ago. Mekhi Becton is one of my favorite players in this draft class. Amazing physical specimen. I expected him to test freakishly, and he did. This is a freak athlete. He moves so well for a guy who's 6'7", 364. He ran a 5'1", flat 40. That's unbelievable. His quickness and mobility is beyond none. And it's, it's just unbelievable the way he moves at the left tackle position. And his power and his strength and his build is just unbelievable. So I think the Browns would really be making a mistake not going offensive line. And to be more specific, with the offensive lineman on the board, they'd low-key be making a mistake if that offensive lineman's name was not Mekhi Becton. At 11, I got Jerry Judy, wide receiver, Alabama. Not going to the Jets. We got a trade here. The Denver Broncos have moved up. They're going to be sending pick 15 along with pick 77 to the New York Jets. So the Jets are moving down four spots, and they're going to add a third-round pick in the process. This might not be enough for the Jets, but considering all the needs they have, they can maybe reach for a receiver at 15, maybe hope that Henry Ruggs falls, or hope that one of the offensive tackles they like falls. But nonetheless, it is the Broncos who are going to get Judy. They are in desperate need of more receivers, Cortland Sutton was excellent last year, but they need somebody next to him. Adding an elite route runner in Judy, who tested well at the Combine and is an all-around really good receiver, I think will help this Broncos team tremendously. I don't think he's the physical tools of a guy like Julio Jones to ever become a top receiver in the game, but I think his tools will help him become really, really good right away and really, really help him be a special player in this league for a long time. So I think the most important thing with that trade-up is the Broncos are not only getting a receiver in Jerry Judy, who's great, but they're also taking him away from their divisional rival because he'd be the easy pick here at 12 to Oakland. So instead, they're going to have to settle 
I put settle on air quotes for Henry Ruggs because this is not a downgrade. Henry Ruggs is a phenomenal player, almost as good of a prospect as Judy. Obviously, we know the speed is there. Ruggs ended up running a 4-2-7, but he's a very well-rounded prospect. He's an underrated route runner. He has great hands, and he's not just speed. Anyone who tells you, oh, he's just speed, that's a lazy take. And you got to do some more research on him, my friends. Henry Ruggs is a great, great prospect. And this is not John Ross 2.0. The Raiders are not drafting the next John Ross. They are drafting a phenomenal, highly explosive athlete who can do wonders to an offense. Pick 13, Jordan Love, quarterback, Utah State to the Colts. They could go with a guy like Javon Kimball here. But with Henry Ruggs gone... I do think they are going to go with Love because they. it doesn't seem like they believe in Jacoby Brissett. I wouldn't be surprised to see them sign Phillip Rivers in the offseason. However, Phillip Rivers is not the long-term answer, and I don't think they should sign him to begin with. So I think what they should do is keep Brissett on the roster. Maybe I don't even think they should draft Jordan Love here. I think they should wait till maybe later in the draft and try to find someone. But I, th I think they have bigger needs, and this is not a pick I necessarily agree with. But I don't think they believe in Brissett. And having an offensive mastermind like Frank Reich at head coach, who can really develop young, raw quarterbacks. I do think the fit does make sense. And that ain't a guy like Jordan Love, who is raw, but he, we know he has the physical tools. He tested well at the combine, which we expected. This is a good athlete who is a cannon of an arm, but just isn't accurate and doesn't possess the intangibles. But a lot of that can be taught. And especially with having a guru like Frank Reich at the head coaching position to groom him. I think the fit could be really fun. And Jordan Love could be a great player. Plus, maybe having Phillip Rivers as a mentor. I mean, I understand Rivers and interceptions were uh, sort of linked together last season. And obviously, the same could be said for Jordan Love. Nonetheless, I think having a guy like Phillip Rivers in that quarterback room could be really helpful for a young player in Jordan Love. Pick 14, Jedrick Wills, offensive tackle, Alabama. To the Bucks, they are in need of offensive line talent. They have a few holes, but I think going with probably the best player on the board in Jedrick Wills does make sense. A lot of people think he's a surefire top ten pick. I don't think so. I think teams are looking for left tackles because most quarterbacks are righties, and even though Wills is talented, he's not a left tackle. He's a right tackle, and I don't think that's going to make him fall too much. I think the latest he'll go is this 14-15 range, but I do think it'll have him fall a little bit. He is a one-year wonder. He was great this one year, though. Phenomenal pass blocker. Probably the safest pass blocker in this draft class. He tested pretty well at the Combine, and I don't think he's a bad prospect. I just think he's a limited prospect with his ceiling. He needs to work on his run blocking a little bit. He's not a bad run blocker by any means, but he does have some uh, technique to work on but nonetheless he does have a very high ceiling and I'd even this is a good pick for Tampa Bay pick 15 the Jets who moved down from 11 they're gonna pick Caleb on chase on Ed Rusher from LSU this may be a surprise pick to some especially with a guy like Andrew Thomas still on the board but all the receivers are gone feels like Thomas's stock is lowering a little bit he could be the pick here but they also need edge and I think adding a guy like Caleb on chase on does make a ton of sense Caleb Vaughn reminds me so much of Brian Burns coming out of last year's class. I think Caleb Vaughn Chase on is a direct clone of Burns. Not great run stoppers, but they're dynamic athletes. Phenomenal speed and length coming off the edge. Burns ran a 4-5. Chase on did not test at the combine, but I assume his 40 time would have been around that 4-5 or five range as well. And Burns had a very underrated rookie year. So I think if the Jets know they're getting Brian Burns 2.0 here, I think they'll gladly take that and then pick 16 Javon Kinlaw interior defensive line from South Carolina I'm a huge fan of Kinlaw I think uh, he's right up there with Derek Brown a lot of people think Brown is the clear IDL one and then Kinlaw is the clear IDL two I don't think it's that easy for me I think Brown is a more refined player right now but I think Kinlaw has more athletic tools I think he's a little bit more upside and I think he is a little bit better of a pass rusher so I think the Falcons are getting a great value pick here, getting a guy in the middle of their defensive line to pair with Grady Jarrett, who just signed that big extension last offseason. I think this is a great pick for the Falcons, fitting a need 
and then getting probably the best player available. Next up, we got the Dallas Cowboys here at pick 17, and there are three ways I think they go. Edge, safety, or corner. I don't think it'll be edge in this scenario because Caleb on Chason is gone, and I don't think there are any edge rushers who could really go in this range. Talent-wise and tape-wise, maybe A.J. Epinesa, but after his bad combine showing, I don't think he goes this high. Maybe safety, but I think it's a little bit too early for both Grant Delpit and Xavier McKinney. So that leads us with corner, and that leaves us with two. Christian Fulton and C.J. Henderson. A lot of people would choose Henderson here. I think Fulton's the better prospect, and I think Fulton will get picked before C.J. Henderson. I'll talk about why C.J. Henderson will go lower than most expect when we get to his pick. For right now, I want to talk about Fulton because I was very intrigued by the CB2 race at the Combine. What I mean by that is who the second best corner in the draft would be. Okuda is the clear number one, but I thought Fulton was really going to go down some boards, including my own after the Combine, but he didn't. He tested very well. He tested better than I expected, and some of those guys who I thought had a chance at passing him, at least on my personal board, like Jeff Gladney, like Noah Igbenogany did not pass him. I think both of those guys still perform as well, and they're both great, but neither of them passed Christian Fulton. Fulton is still the CB2 in this draft class, in my opinion, and the Cowboys getting another corner to replace now Byron Jones, as it looks like he is good as gone. If I'm the Cowboys, I would prioritize re-signing Byron Jones over Amari Cooper. Doesn't look like they're going to do that. I think that's a mistake. I think Michael Gallup can be a number one receiver in an offense and then maybe they use a second or third round pick on a wide receiver and re-sign Byron Jones shore up your secondary that's already a little bit weak to begin with I, I just don't get that I understand you want to entice Dak by giving him weapons but I think they should prioritize Byron Jones over Amari Cooper and I think they are making a mistake by re-signing Cooper over Jones Pick 18, Andrew Thomas, offensive tackle, Georgia, to the Miami Dolphins. They need offensive line, and Thomas has been great with the Georgia Bulldogs. Seems like he has lost some stock a little bit during this pre-season, uh, or pre-draft process, postseason, I guess you could say. And it seemed like Thomas was going to be a top five pick in December, and it seems like he's fallen a little bit. Didn't test as well as some of his freak athlete offensive tackles did at the Combine. But he was not a freak athlete to begin with, and he was not supposed to test insanely well. The thing with him is uh, the production. He has been a little bit more consistent than those top three tackles in Worths, Becton, and Wills. But those three guys have higher ceilings because of their athleticism. So that's why Thomas Falls, Dolphins are going to get him here. Great, great value pick. This will be the day one left tackle for whoever starts there, whether it's Fitzpatrick or Herbert or... They surprises and get someone else. Pick 19, Kenneth Murray, linebacker, Oklahoma, to the Raiders. Murray tested very well, and I think he will get picked before Patrick Queen. I'd still pick Queen, personally, over Kenneth Murray, but for right now, I do think Murray will be the first off-ball linebacker off the board. Yes, I'm not counting Simmons as an off-ball linebacker because he does not have a true position. So, technically, Murray is the second linebacker off the board, but since I'm not counting Simmons... He is the first one going to a Raiders team that's really missed linebacker talent. They've not had a good one in a while. And I think adding a guy who can lead your defense right in the middle and Kenneth Murray, I think makes a ton of sense. And the Raiders need to go linebacker early. I think Patrick Queen, I think Patrick Queen would be the better pick here, but this is not a bad selection by any means. Pick 20, we've got a trade. The Saints are going to move up four spots with the Jags. And Jacksonville will receive pick 24 and pick 88. So the it's nearly similar value from moving up from 15 to 11 and then moving up from 24 to 20, with the only difference being the Jets getting a future day three pick and then the Jets are getting an earlier third round pick than the Jaguars are getting here. So technically speaking, the Jaguars and the Broncos are doing good when it comes to these trades. But nonetheless, the Saints are going to move up and get C.J. Henderson, corner from Florida. The Saints are going to move up here because I doubt they think Henderson's going to fall to 24. Jacksonville and Philadelphia are both cornerback needy teams. So, wouldn't be surprised to see C.J. go with one of those two picks. So, the Saints are going to move up for him instead. Henderson is a phenomenal cover corner, great ball skills. 
He is a clone of Greedy Williams from last year's class. And that's part of a reason why I think Henderson's going to go a little bit lower than people expect. Not that Greedy was bad last year. Don't get me wrong. Greedy was great. But Greedy was supposed to be a top 20, 25 pick. But he fell to the second round because of concerns with tackling. I think that's at least the big concern. And CJ Henderson has those same red flags. He is not a consistent tackler. He has trouble finishing plays and the effort level is not always there. Now, I think CJ Henderson's going to go earlier than Greedy Williams. I think people think CJ Henderson's a little bit better of a prospect than Greedy, which I kind of disagree with. I've always been a Greedy Williams guy, but nonetheless, I think CJ's going to go lower than people expect. But this isn't a massive fall by any means. The Saints really want to get themselves a true cut for corner launch sign, Marshawn Lattimore. I think the Saints have a lot of players to pay coming up. Marcus Williams, Ryan Ramchek, and Alvin Kamara are all guys they have to re-sign. So maybe they prioritize some of them over Marshawn Lattimore. Maybe they let a guy like Lattimore go just because they don't have enough money for everybody. I think they should try to re-sign Lattimore, but if you can't, maybe you look to trade him. They could probably fetch a first-round pick for Marshawn Lattimore and then have C.J. Henderson be your replacement. And even if they don't, even if they re-sign Lattimore, they need someone next to him. Chauncey Gardner-Johnson's not really an outside corner. Eli Apple's not really a good corner. So C.J. Henderson can slide right in and be a day-one starter. Pick 21, Justin Jefferson, wide receiver, LSU to the Eagles. Jefferson tested surprisingly well at the combine and coming off a super productive season at LSU where he put up ridiculous numbers with Joe Burrow in that offense. I think the Eagles are going to pick him up here, and I think this is a very nice pick for the Eagles. Jefferson's a good route runner. Obviously, the production is there, and then he tested well athletically at the combine, and Jefferson's one of the biggest risers of this season, and I think he has officially cemented himself as a first-round pick. And then another receiver who did himself really well this uh, past week at the Combine is Denzel Mims, and he's going to go 22 to Buffalo. Mims was a guy I was really high on during the season. During, like, November, December, most people had him as, like, a fourth, fifth-round guy. I really liked Denzel Mims. I had a, I had a late second, early third-round grade at the time on him. Then he performed well at the Senior Bowl, and that's when he started getting some love. He had a late second, or early third-round grade right around then. Uh, but my grade didn't really change for him at the time because I expected him to do well at the Senior Bowl. But I did not expect him to put the numbers that he did up at the Combine. And I think not only has he put himself a first-round pick on most people's boards, but he's put, made him a first-round pick off my board as well. And the Bills, who are in need of a true number one receiver, are going to take him right up. Yeah, they had some guys step up at the receiver position last year. John Brown and Cole Beasley both proved to be pretty good signings at least for the short term. But I think getting a guy like Mims, who performed well at the Senior Bowl, performed very well at the Combine, and played very well this season for Baylor, I think makes a ton of sense. And the Bills are getting a really, really good player here at 22. Pick 23, Yaturgos Matos, edge rusher, Penn State to the Patriots. There are a few edge rushers they could go here. Maybe AJ Epinesa goes off the board here. I think the fit of Zach Bond in New England Makes a ton of sense. He has a lot of Kyle Van Noy similarities, in my opinion. But I think we're going to go with Gross Matos, who probably is the most upside of the group. Uh, he's been productive at Penn State. Doesn't put up insane numbers, but puts up good numbers. And the Patriots, I think they could use another piece or two for that defense, who has a few big free agents this offseason. Kyle Van Noy, Devin McCourty, and they could look to get replacements there. Maybe, as I said, a guy like Zach Bond. Maybe they look at Grant Delpit or Xavier McKinney, one of the safeties. I guess if they want to replace McCoy or McCourty, I think McKinney would probably be the pick just because of his similarities to Devin McCourty, or at least more similarities than Delpit. But I do think it could be a Turk Gross Matos here who can sort of be the Trey Flowers replacement, if you will. The Patriots, while their defense was great last year, they were missing that elite pass rusher. Not that Trey Flowers is elite, per se, but missing that good pass rusher. And I think Yatur Gross Matos can be just that. And then pick 24, Patrick Queen, linebacker at LSU to the Jaguars. This is the pick they just got from New Orleans. Queen is a very dynamic player. Not a freak athlete, but he put up good numbers at the Combine. Not the biggest. He does not have a gigantic frame. However, the Jags need linebackers. They have Miles Jack, who's good. And they just paid pretty big money to. 
But I think adding another guy like Patrick Queen in the middle of that defense does make a ton of sense. And I think that'd be a nice selection for Jacksonville. Let's finish up the end of the first round, shall we? Starting with the Vikings. They're going to pick Jeff Gladney, cornerback from TCU. Gladney's been a guy I've been high on for a while. Every single mock draft since January, I've had him going in the first round because I've been telling y'all he's going to put up a good combine and he's going to persuade teams that he's a first-round prospect. Well, here we are. He performed well during the combine, and most mocks have him as a first-round pick. What did I tell you? This is about the range where I've had him going, and this is about the range where I think he should go. Right in this late first-round mold, I think it's very fair value for Jeff Gladney, a physical corner who has solid ball skills, pretty good in coverage, and obviously is a very solid athlete. So I think this will be a nice pick for Minnesota. They have a few choices at the cornerback position, but I do have it being Mr. Gladney. Pick 26, A.J. Epinesa, edge rusher from Iowa to the Dolphins. Epinesa's going to lose some money after that bad combine, but not too much. I think he's still a first-round talent. He's been good at Iowa for a while. Phenomenal sophomore season when it comes to rushing to the quarterback. And then last year, he got a lot of double teams, and it was harder for him to put up sack numbers. And Epinesa's versatility can really help him not only as an edge rusher, but as an interior defensive lineman, whereas a guy as like Cale Von Chason, you're not putting him in the middle of your defensive line. That's one of the positives of Epinesa, but with versatility, you want someone who's athletic enough to be really good at both positions. And Epinesa did not test super well athletically. For a modern-day edge rusher, you don't want them running in the fives. I understand Epinesa's game isn't speed built. I understand it's more power built. But I think that's still a pretty bad time. And you would have liked to have seen something faster from him. Pick 27, we have a trade. Note, it's not in blue or green. It's purple because this is a player trade. The Jaguars will be moving up. They're going to be trading edge rusher Yannick Ngakwe to the Seattle Seahawks. For, in exchange for this first round pick, Yannick Ngakwe has been franchise tagged by the Jaguars, but it sounds like he does not want to come to a long-term agreement with them. So I have the Jaguars doing a tag and trade. The Seahawks are going to have to part with their first round pick, but getting a guy as good as Yannick Ngakwe, you might have to part with your first round pick. Yannick Ngakwe is a stud. This kid is amazing. And the Jaguars are letting go of a really, really good football player. With this being said, the Seahawks would probably pay Ngakwe if they're giving up their first round pick. They're not going to do what they did with Jadavian Clowney. And this implies that Clowney's gone, by the way. Jadavian Clowney would not be returning to Seattle if they get Yannick Ngakwe and vice versa. Um, if they bring Clowney back, they're not going to make this trade. They don't want two expensive edge rushers. Sure, they'd like two talented ones, but they don't want to break the bank for two players at the same position so this implies that Clowney is gone and now Seattle can get the Clowney replacement and Gakwe isn't necessarily the athlete that Clowney is but he's been more productive and he's been better than Jadavian Clowney so I think this is a really good move for Seattle even though they have to par off a high draft pick and then Jacksonville their third first rounder and like their first two it's going to be on the defensive side of a ball to be specific for front seven is they go Curtis Weaver, edge rusher from Boise State. I think NFL teams are a lot higher than GMs on Curtis Weaver. Very productive. He checks all the boxes athletically. And even though most people have him as a mid-second rounder, I'd say, I think he's going to be one of those surprises who's a first-round pick. And while it may seem like a surprise to the average viewer, it's not going to really be a surprise because Curtis Weaver has first-round talent. I mean, he's been great at Boise State, and he can be a perfect replacement for Yannick Ngakwe. So the Jags have really done a good job of improving their front seven in getting Derek Brown, Patrick Queen, and Curtis Weaver, and also adding a third-round pick in the process from New Orleans. Pick 28, Neville Gallimore, and two-year defensive lineman out of Oklahoma to the Ravens. Of course, Kenneth Murray is gone, and I've had them getting Murray a lot recently. I don't think there are any linebackers worthy of this selection, so I think we're going to go with interior defensive line here. Gallimore is one massive physical specimen. And he put up freakish numbers at the combine. This wasn't too much of a surprise. We all knew he was a freak athlete. But dang, he put up numbers. And I think he has cemented himself as a first-round prospect. I think he's passed Ross Blacklock on a lot of boards. Blacklock seemed like he was going to be a first-round pick for a minute. And he still could be. 
but I don't think he gets picked over Neville Gallimore. Pick 29, Terrell Lewis, edge rusher Alabama to the Titans. Lewis is a great player, certainly a first-round talent in my opinion, but the medical concerns. If he can check all the boxes medically, he'll be a great player in this league. Him and Harold Young, side-by-side, side, would be scary. And I think having a dynamic pass rush duo like that could lead to great things for this Tennessee defense. At pick 30, I have the Packers getting Josh Jones, offensive tackle, out of Houston. The Packers need another offensive tackle. David Bakhtiari is great. But on the other side, you got an aging, starting to get now injury-prone, Brian Bulaga. Josh Jones, I still think, is raw, and you can start Bulaga for another season, but I think having Jones develop behind him does make a ton of sense. While Jones is raw, he had a great season this year at Houston, and the upside is certainly there, so I think this would be a nice pick for the Packers. Pick 31, Grant Delpit, safety LSU to the 49ers. Delpit was a little bit inconsistent this year, but he's still a really, really good player. Just needs to work on tackling and simple refinements like that, and I think he'll be a great player in this league. The Niners are missing a few pieces in that secondary, in my opinion. I think adding a guy like Delpit could really, really be helpful. I think this is sort of similar to the 2018 safety class, as I've said, with Minka Fitzpatrick and Derwin James at the top. Now, I don't think Delpit and McKinney are as good as those guys. I don't think they'll be drafted as high as them, and I don't think they'll make as much of an immediate impact as those two, with Delpit being your Derwin James and McKinney being your Minka Fitzpatrick, but... I think adding a guy who can give you a fraction of what Derwin James gives you could be really, really good for that liner defense. And then pick number 32, I have Jonathan Taylor running back Wisconsin to the Chiefs. They could go defense here, but after seeing the numbers Taylor put at the combine, it's going to be surprising seeing him not be a first-round pick. I understand there are concerns. Uh, he got the ball a ton at Wisconsin, nearly 1,000 touches in three seasons with fumbling concerns. That could move him down, but I think the upside he possesses and the speed and the power and the well-roundedness that Jonathan Taylor brings to the table is going to be hard for a team like Kansas City to really pass on him. and have, not, not just depending on the pass, it could be really good. Just give Mahomes uh, a few plays where he doesn't have to be desperate and launch it down the field. Have a dependable running back who you can really lean on in certain situations. I think this is a great pick for KC. Let's move to the second round. We've already got a trade. The Bengals will be moving down a few spots as it's the Carolina Panthers who are going to move up to pick 33. The Bengals will receive pick 38 and pick 110. That is the Panthers' fourth round selection. They're going to go with Jacob Eason, quarterback from Washington. A lot of Panthers fans might question the trade up for a questionable prospect, but I won't be surprised to see some of those QB needy teams moving here in the early second round to get their guy and the Panthers just want to make sure that they can get Easton, who has the physical tools to be really, really good, but has been super inconsistent in his college career. I'm not as high on Easton as others, and I think this is certainly too high of a selection for him. I think he's more in that J Jalen Hurts, Jake Fromm territory at, at like the middle of the third round, I'd say. But nonetheless, uh, I think Easton uh, holds probably a little bit more upside than both of them. And the Panthers, who are in need of a quarterback, I think Cam Newton is... I understand they said they're going to keep him, but even with his medical concerns, are you really sure you want to depend on a guy who just you don't know if you can have for a 16-game season? So I wouldn't be surprised to see if them not only trade Cam Newton, but even if they don't, drafting a guy who can develop behind him for a season or two and eventually become a starter. Pick 34, Ross Blacklock, interior defensive lineman, TCU, to the Colts. Blacklock has been really good when he's on the field for TCU. He had an Achilles injury in 2018, but 2017, 2019, he was great. And the Colts could use some help in the middle of that uh, defensive line. And I think adding a guy like Blacklock would be a great selection. Pick 35, one of my favorite players in this draft going to my favorite team. You got to love it. Lions get Noah Igbenogany, cornerback from Auburn. Very good cover corner. Uh, he put up good numbers of a combine, but yesterday at his pro day, he improved his 40-yard dash by five hundredths of a second, which in NFL terms is a lot. He improved his vert jump by about three inches. I believe he now has a 40-inch vertical to go with a 4-4-3-40, and I think he's a first-round prospect, and a team like the Lions, who's in need of a corner, they did not get Okuda in the first round, 
Adding a guy who can be the Slay replacement or can complement Darius Slay, I think, could be great. Along with Justin Coleman and Amani Oruarie in that secondary, I think is a great selection for the Lions. Pick 36, Zach Bond, edge rusher, Wisconsin to the Giants. I think this is as low as he will go. I think Bond will either go around here or he could go in the late first round. You can have him rushing the passer. You can have him as an off-ball linebacker. As I said, possesses a lot of similarities to a guy like Kyle Van Noy. And I think the Giants uh, could use both edge rushers and off-ball linebackers in their defense because their pass rush and their linebacking core is atrocious. So this doesn't kill two birds with one stone, but it kills one bird with two stones, kind of, because if Bond doesn't work out at one spot, you can put him at the other. Pick 37. This is from the Chargers in the Tua Tonga Vailoa trade-up. The Lions are going to get safety. Antoine Winfield Jr. out of Minnesota doubling down on the secondary. This is not a pick I would personally be happy with, and it's not because of a player. We'll get to Antoine Winfield in a minute. He's a great, great talent, but I don't know why the Lions would consider going safety. They got Tracy Walker in the third round of 2018. They got Will Harris in the third round last year. So I understand they want a guy who can be like a hybrid role, put him uh, in the box, sort of like what Tavon Wilson's been. But I don't know. I don't I don't want to use a second round pick on a hybrid player. And that's not what Winfield really is. Winfield is more of a cover guy. And the concern with him going into combine was the long speed. And he ran, what, like a 4-4-5? Four, four, His 40-yard dash shocked me. It was incredible. I don't know why more people weren't talking about this. This is what, That was one of the biggest surprises for me at the combine. I was worried he was going to run like a 4-6 or a 4-6-5 in that ballpark. But he ran a phenomenal 40, and I could easily see him sneaking into the first round, and he's the second safety off the board here. Xavier McKinney has not been taken yet. So while this is not a pick I agree with just based on need, the value is not bad, and the Lions will be getting a really good player here. Pick 38, this is from the Panthers trade down, which just happened a moment ago. The Bengals are up, and they're going to go Josh Uchi, edge rusher from Michigan. Uchi is a speedy player. He's slim, not going to have his hand in the dirt. He'll be that edge rusher, linebacker type player. The Bengals are in need of some pass rushers. They had some talented guys in the dirt, like Sam Hopper, like Carl Lawson, but I think they could use a speed rusher like a Josh Uchi, so this is a good pick for them. Pick 39, Cesar Ruiz, interior offensive lineman out of Michigan to the Dolphins. This is a steal. Ruiz is a great, great player. Put him at center. He's raw, but the upside he possesses is really, really good. And I think this is a phenomenal selection for the Dolphins. And then pick 40, Austin Jackson, offensive tackle out of USC to the Cardinals. He tested well at the combine like we expected. And the Cardinals need offensive line really bad. I think they should go with one at eight. But if they don't, they're going to have to go with one here at 40. Next up here at 41, the Browns are going to go Xavier McKinney, safety from Alabama. The McKinney slide has come to an end. And I don't think he deserves this slide. I think he's a good player, and I think he talents a first-round pick. However, coming off a bad combine, he ran a bad 40 time. I think he was hurt, so that might be part of a reason. But I still see him falling a little bit, and I have Antoine Winfield going above him now. Yeah, yeah, I do. That's my uh, that's that's a hot take for sure. But even not that I'm, I'm not saying Winfield's the better player than McKinney. I just wouldn't be surprised if both Delpit and Winfield go before him. But nonetheless, this is a great pick for Cleveland. I think they're in need of another safety. Demarius Randall, Morgan Burnett, nah, they're not that great. And I don't think either of them have that long left on their contract to begin with. So I think Randall might be a free agent. I might be wrong about that. But getting a guy like McKinney, a phenomenal cover safety who is rangy. I was expecting a faster 40, but remember, he could have been hurt. So that doesn't tell the full story most likely and he's faster in game it seems like so I think this is a nice pick for Cleveland and an absolute steal here in the middle of the second round pick 42 AJ Terrell cornerback Clemson to the Jags Terrell wasn't a guy I really had my eye on headed into the combine but he tested really well sneakily well not a lot of people are talking about him but he tested well and I think his stock is certainly higher there's a chance he'd be a first-round pick in a different class, but since we're so deep at the cornerback position, he falls here to 42, where Jacksonville is going to swoop him up. Another player to add to Jacksonville's defense 
It seems like they only care about that side of the ball for crying out loud. Pick 43, Trayvon Diggs, cornerback, Alabama, to the Chicago Bears. Diggs is a really, really good player. I think he's probably a borderline first-round talent, and this is an excellent selection value-wise here for the Chicago Bears, who are in need of another cornerback alongside Kyle Fuller. And not to mention, he gets to cover his younger, his older brother, Stephon Diggs, two times a season, so that'll be fun. Pick 44, LaVisca Chenault, wide receiver, Colorado. Another guy who tested kind of bad at the combine, mainly because of his slow 40, but sort of like Xavier McKinney, it seems like LaVisca was hurt, and he did not run a second 40 after getting, what, like a 4 five, nine, which is a very bad time for Chenault. I was expecting him to be in the 4 fours, maybe high 4 fives, but obviously he was clearly hurt. So once again, that doesn't tell the full story, but that really gives us some medical question marks with Chenault, who's been injury prone in his career. So I think there are some medical concerns here, which is why he's going to fall this late into the second round. But I think the Colts, who are in need of a dynamic wide receiver alongside T.Y. Hilton, I think they're going to go with him. They have some talent at the position, but T.Y. is getting older. Paris Campbell has improved a lot, and Zach Paschal can only do so much. So I think this is a good pick here for Indy, getting themselves a four-headed monster at receiver of all four of those guys can play well. Pick 45, Marlon Davidson, interior defensive lineman, Auburn to the Bucks. They need some help in the interior of their D-line. They got Vita Vez, the nose tackle. So I think having a guy like Marlon Davidson next to him, who's used to having a big run stuffer in the middle in Derrick Brown in college, when I'll have Vita Vea in the pros, I think the thick could be really, really good here. I think this is a nice selection for Tampa Bay. Pick 46, we have a trade. The Packers are moving up 16 spots with the Broncos. The Broncos will get pick 62, pick 94, which is Packers' third rounder, along with a 2021 fifth to select Jalen Rager, wide receiver out of TCU. And as a Lions fan, I do not like this at all. Jalen Rager is a stud. If the Packers got him, I would be a sad, sad man. Rager had a confusing combine. He tested well at the vert and the broad jump, but had a really bad three-co time and an underwhelming 40 time. But he's a lot faster on tape. And he's a fast, dynamic player for TCU. So don't let the 40 time fool you. This is a top 20 talent, in my opinion. And the Packers just got themselves a steal. Pick 47, DeAndre Swift running back out of Georgia to the Falcons. Devontae Freeman looks like he's as good as gone. The Falcons need a new bell cow running back. And DeAndre Swift, who's number one on most people's boards, is a very nice value selection here this late into the draft. And then pick 48, T. Higgins. Wide receiver clubs into the Jets. T. Higgins' stock sort of declined after not testing at the Combine. And I think getting a big-bodied receiver to add to this offense could be really, really good for Sam Darnold. Getting a guy with a big catch radius in T. Higgins makes a ton of sense for New York. Pick 49, we got Cole Komet. Tight end Notre Dame to the Steelers. There are a few ways Pittsburgh could go here. Maybe interior offensive line. Maybe edge rusher. Maybe running back. Heck, maybe they look at Hurts or Fromm. But I've been going with Komet, the top tight end in the draft, in my opinion. And now the first one off the board. He tested very well at the Combine. Was my number one tight end before the Combine. So that just proved it to me even more. And Vance McDonald is not great. The Steelers need to have a legit tight end. And Cole Komet is a very underrated prospect, in my opinion, who could become really, really good in this league. Pick 50, Lloyd Cushenberry, interior offensive lineman out of LSU to Chicago. They need some help there. Uh, Kyle Long's retiring. Cody Whitehair is probably gone this offseason. I don't think they have him to an extension. So all they've got in the interior offensive line right now is James Daniels, who's great, but they need more. So Lloyd Cushenberry could be a really, really good pick for this team. He's a bit raw, but the upside is there. Pick 51, Julian Aquara, edge rusher Notre Dame to the Cowboys. Aquara is a prospect I like. The production isn't always there, but you know the talent is. The athleticism is as well. And I think adding a guy like Aquara to this defense could be really, really good for Dallas, who's needed, in need of a complimentary edge rusher next to Demarcus Lawrence. Pick 52, Willie Gay, linebacker, Mississippi State to the Rams. Willie Gay is an interesting prospect. Massive off-the-field concerns. However, a freak athlete. He had a 4-4-5-40 at the combine. You can have him rushing the passer. You can have him as an off-ball linebacker. I view him a little bit more as an edge rusher, to be honest, but it seems like more draft experts 
have him listed as a linebacker. You could put him at either spot, in my opinion, and he could be successful. If he can just uh, control the off-the-field stuff, I think he'll be fine. Pick 53, Jalen Johnson, cornerback, Utah, to the Eagles. They need another corner. Johnson has been super productive with the Utes, and this is a phenomenal value selection, getting themselves a super productive player in college. Pick 54, we have a trade. I had this trade in my last mock. The Baltimore Ravens are going to move up here, and the Bills are going to receive edge rusher Matt Judon via the franchise tag. So I have the Ravens tagging Judon and then sending him to Buffalo for this pick, which I had on my last mock, and I think makes a ton of sense. Buffalo is in need of a Pro Bowl caliber edge rusher. Judon's only really been good for one season, but he's been impactful in the season's past, just didn't have as big of a role with guys like Terrell Suggs and Zadarius Smith stealing the shine. But he got his opportunity last year, and he delivered. And he's going to get a massive payday, but I don't think Baltimore is the team who wants to pay him. But I think they're going to tag him and move him to an AFC playoff contender in Buffalo. That might be scary for some Ravens fans, but this is the best offer I think they can get, and they're going to take it. And with their this selection, we're going to go with wide receiver Brandon Ayuk from Arizona State. This is a really good pick for Baltimore. They're needed another receiver, and I really like Ayuk. I think he's a borderline first-round prospect. He's a great physical receiver. He tested well in the combine, and I think adding him alongside Marquise Brown could be really, really good for this offense. Pick 55, Troy Pride, cornerback Notre Dame to the Atlanta Falcons. Would have liked to see him test a tad bit better, but I think he tested well overall and has put himself as a second-round uh, potential talent. The Falcons need another corner. All they really got is Desmond Trufant, who's old and injury-prone. I mean, he's not that old, but he's like 30-ish by now. And he's injury-prone, and even so, the Falcons need another one anyway. So, killing two birds with one st Actually, not really, because they're still going to need more corners after this, but this is a good start. Troy Pride is a good player. And then pick 56, Lucas Nyang, offensive tackle, TCU. Nyang's a really, really underrated player. The Dolphins now get two tackles in this draft with Niang and Andrew Thomas. Both of them can start right away. I guess you got Thomas at the left, Niang at the right. That's a really... And say, says uh, Cesar Ruiz at center, Michael Deiter at guard. All they need is another guard, and that offensive line is pretty much complete, assuming all three of these guys pan out. Let's round out the second round, starting with pick 57. I've got the... Houston Texans selecting J.K. Dobbins, running back, Ohio State. They're needed the number running back. This is an absolute steal. I don't know how J.K. Dobbins has fallen this far, but he has, and the Texans are going to take him up. Dobbins did not test at the combine, which is why I think he's fallen on most boards to the third running back taken rather than the first or second. But nonetheless, this is a great selection for Houston getting a very, very dynamic player who was great this past season for the Buckeyes. Pick 58, Jonah Jackson, interior offensive lineman, also out of Ohio State to the Minnesota Vikings. The Vikings have needed help at O-line for a while. They drafted a couple of interior offensive linemen last year and Garrett Bradbury and Drew Samia. Samia was quiet, but he was a fourth-round pick. And then Garrett Bradbury, I think, was pretty good, but adding another interior lineman in Jonah Jackson does make sense to me. Pick 59, Isaiah Wilson, tackled Georgia to the Seahawks. You can't have Russell Wilson running around in the pocket forever. He's been great at it since Seattle picked him, but he's also 31, 32 by now, and eventually his mobility is going to start to go, and he's really going to have to depend on his pocket passing, which he's obviously great with, but I think he's going to have to start preparing to give Russell Wilson more time because he's not going to be able to evade as much pressure as he gets older and less athletic. Pick 60, Akeem Davis Gaver, linebacker, Appalachian State to the Ravens. I really like Akeem. I think he's a great player, and he has certainly warranted a second-round selection. The Ravens are in need of an off-ball linebacker to get their official C.J. Mosley replacement after he left last season. Pick 61, Matthew Pert, offensive tackle at a UConn of the Titans. His measurables are insane. He has arms as long as tree branches. And the Titans are in need of help on the offensive line. Get themselves their Jack Conklin replacement. I don't see them bringing him back this offseason with likely focusing in on Derrick Henry and Ryan Tannehill. I do expect the Titans to bring them both back, as they should bring both of them back. I think they're making a mistake otherwise. But 
nonetheless, I do think this would be a good pick for them. Pick 62, this is the selection Denver got from Green Bay in the Jalen Reger trade-up. They're going to go with Bryce Hall, cornerback, Virginia. Hall is a great player. He did not play towards the second half of the season last year, but he is a, easily a first-round talent. And I don't know why the health concerns are really dragging him down. I understand medical is important, but I don't think his injuries are as serious as people really think they are. And the value here at 62 is outstanding for the Broncos. Pick 63, Cameron Dantzler, cornerback, Mississippi State to the Chiefs. Dantzler put up a slow 40. I think it was a little bit over 4-6. And he has sort of fallen down his stock just a little bit. I still think he will go here in the second round to a Chiefs team who could need some extra corners. And then pick 64, KJ Hamler, wide receiver, Penn State. He did not test of a combine, which sucks. I wanted to see that man's 40 time. It was going to be right around that 4-3 range. But still, he's a dynamic playmaker. You can use it so many different ways in your offense. At the slot, in the backfield, doing ends arounds and jet sweeps. He can do a lot of different things for an offense. And he can sort of be a really, really good gadget player for Seattle. So I think this will be a really, really fun pick for them. Now into the third round, the Bengals are going to start off with taking Donovan Peoples-Jones, wide receiver from Michigan. 44 and a half inch vert jump for Peoples-Jones. Good 40 time. So you're probably confused why he's not going any higher. Well, he's just getting punished because this is a great receiver class. The value here at 65 is excellent for Cincinnati. And I think having a guy like A.J. Green, who has phenomenal physical tools as well, Having a guy like Green who can mentor Donovan, I think could be really, really good for this team, and Peoples-Jones can become a phenomenal receiver one day. Pick 66, Prince Tega Wanahogo. Offensive tackle out of Auburn to the Redskins. Trent Williams is as good as gone. I expect him traded this offseason, and the Redskins are going to need a replacement. So they're going to go with Prince Tega Wanahogo, who's still a little bit raw, still a little bit new to the game of football, but talented player. He's been great at Auburn these past few seasons. Pick 67, Michael Pittman. Wide receiver at a USC to the Lions. Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones both have contracts up this offseason. And while I'm sure Galladay is going to get re-signed, I don't know about Marvin Jones. So in, wide receiver is in a need this season because both Kenny and Jones are under contract for this coming season. But after that, after the 2021 offseason, Neither of them are. So while Galladay, I'm sure, will be back, I don't know how sure the Lions are on re-signing Marvin Jones. So I think adding another receiver like Michael Pittman could be very impactful. Pittman is a big-bodied receiver who tested well at the Combine. Actually has a few, couple similarities to Kenny Galladay. I'm not saying, I'm not comparing the two players, but I think having the twin towers on each side, having a giant-framed guy in Michael Pittman and then, and then another one in Kenny Galladay, I think that can be great for a strong arm like Stafford. Pick 68, Ezra Cleveland, offensive tackle, Boise State to the Jets. The Jets have not touched offensive line yet, and that's going to change. I promise, Jets fans, this is not the last one either. Pick 69, Justin Matabuike, interior defensive lineman, Texas A&M to the Panthers. I'm not as high on Justin as others, but I do think potential is there. And the Panthers are in need of some interior D-line. They could look at a guy like Derek Brown at 7, but with Okuda there, it was too hard to pass up. They could have looked at Blacklock in the second round, but since they traded up for Easton, they couldn't do that. So they're going to have to settle for Matabuike here, who's a talented player, but the motor isn't always there, and he can take some plays off. Pick 70, Cam Akers, running back, Florida State to the Dolphins. They need a bell cow back bad, and adding three new offensive linemen, that's going to be perfect for a young player in Cam Akers who impressed during the combine. This is a really, really nice value selection for the Dolphins. They're getting a great player in Mr. Akers. Pick 71, Sadiq Charles, offensive tackle, LSU to the Lions. This pick is also from the Tua Tunga Vailoa trade-up. And I think tackle is a bigger need for Detroit than most think. Taylor Decker is also a free agent in 2021. And then I expect Rick Wagner to be cut this offseason as cap casualty. He's making like nine or ten mil a year. That's way too much for Rick Wagner. So I think the Lions could look at tackle this offseason. And getting a guy like Charles in the third round has really seen his stock rise the past couple months. I think that could be a good pick for them. And the big 72, Raekwon Davis, interior defensive lineman at Alabama to the Cardinals. That's a pretty big need for them. And while I think they really want to go offense in the first round, I think 
waiting this long could be risky for an interior defensive lineman, but they wanted to be antsy and get that wide receiver early, and then they had to go O-line in round two. So now they'll finally address that need here in the third round in getting a talented player in Raekwon Davis, who probably should have declared for last year's draft. Probably would have been a first-round pick, but he stayed in school, didn't really help his stock out. Now he's going to go about here in the third round. Next up here at pick 73, I had the Jaguars finally go in offense as they select Chase Claypool, wide receiver Notre Dame. Claypool had an excellent combine. He put up historic numbers, gigantic frame, had a really good vert jump, a uh, 4 4 5 40 yard dash. I mean, he was getting athletic comparisons to Calvin Johnson, which is incredible. Johnson is one of those dominant players to ever play the position. So being in that company is excellent for Chase Claypool. And I think he's really helped his stock after a good combine. And the Jaguars are going to pick him up here at 73. At 74, Matt Hennessy, interior offensive lineman out of Temple to the Browns. They got an offensive lineman earlier in Mekhi Becton, but they need more. They need a lot more. So adding a guy in Hennessy who's been really good for them these past couple years, I think makes sense. Pick 75, Jabari Zuniga, edge rusher from Florida to the Colts. Zuniga's stock seems like it's going to increase a little bit after a good combine. And the Colts are in need of some more pass rushers, so I think this is a nice pick for them. Pick 76, Jalen Hurts, quarterback Oklahoma to the Bucks. I don't know how sure they are on Jameis Winston, but if he's brought back on a short-term deal, like one or two years, I could see them picking a guy like Hurts here, who had a very good combine and I think has passed Jake Fromm as the sixth quarterback off the board. Pick 77, Robert Hunt, interior offensive lineman, Louisiana Lafayette to the Jets. This is the pick they got in the Jerry Judy trade-up. So, Jets fans, I appreciate your patience. Here you go. Hunt has been a very solid player for the Raging Cajuns these past couple seasons. He will plug in right away because the Jets need interior offensive line pretty badly. I almost had him going with another one at 79, but I decided to lay off that, even though I considered it. Pick 78, Daryl Taylor, edge rusher, Tennessee, to the Atlanta Falcons. Taylor's a player I really like. The athleticism is there. He's been a really solid player for the Vols, and the Falcons are in need of edge rusher. Vic Beasley is gone. I don't see them picking a guy like Caleb Von Chase on in the first round because he is quite similar to Vic Beasley, and I think considering the speed rusher and Beasley didn't work, I don't know how Chase Son would fit. So I think waiting to draft a not as good edge rusher here, but still a talented one in Taylor in the third round makes sense. People were talking about how it's a deep receiver class, deep cornerback class, but it's a deep edge rusher class. So this is some nice value here for the Falcons in the middle of the third round. Pick 79, Damon Arnett, cornerback Ohio State to the Jets. I think his stock might have dipped a little bit after the combine, but he's still a very good player, and the Jets are in need of another corner. I think they'll cut Tremaine Johnson this offseason. So the only difference between Arnett and Johnson uh, would be that Arnett can actually be a positive impact for them. Obviously, the Jets way overpaid Tremaine Johnson. That was a very bad signing for them. So now they can get a new corner who they can build around and is not on a $15 million contract. And then pick 80. Is this 911? Yes, this is 911. Uh, well, I have something to, to tell y'all. The Raiders have just come away with an absolute steal. Can you please come and help? Thanks. Uh, in other words, yes, this is a steal. Kyle Duggar is a phenomenal value pick here at 80. As you could tell by my uh, two-second one-person skit, that was really corny. But Duggar is an athletic freak. He tested well at the Combine. He had a great senior bowl. And he's been good for Lennar Ryan for a while. I understand he's a Division three player. No, he's Division two. He's Lennar Ryan is Division two, which is the best of competition. But Duggar is still a really, really good player. I think he's easily second-round talent. I think he could make a case for him to be the third safety picked. I don't know. I'm having trouble who deciding who's better between him and Antoine Winfield. Winfield was an early second round pick, and I called that good value. So the fact that Duggar gets to go here at 80 is an absolute steal, and it's a travesty that he's been on the board this long. Pick 81, I have the Raiders going with Jake Fromm, quarterback out of Georgia. Fromm did not 
uh, play particularly well during the combine, but he had a good season, and he's been good all three years as the starter for Georgia. This is not a bad player the Raiders are getting, just someone he needs to be groomed, and he can sit behind Derek Carr for a year or two and try to develop low risk, I wouldn't say high reward, I'd say more like moderate reward selection for Oakland, but it's still not Oakland, Las Vegas. How many times have I called them Oakland today? I'm very curious about that. I'm not used to calling them Las Vegas. This is going to take some time to adjust. Pick 82, Devon Hamilton, defensive tackle, Ohio State, to the Dallas Cowboys. Hamilton had a quiet but good combine, and now the Cowboys get another piece to add to their front seven. They got Julian Aquara in the last round. Now here they get another talented player in Hamilton. Pick 83, the Broncos are going to select Malik Harrison, linebacker, Ohio State. Broncos are having a really, really good draft. Moving up to get Jerry Judy at 11 without trading too much away. Uh, moving down in the second and getting a first-round talent in Bryce Hall. And then here, another good value pick in Malik Harrison. The Broncos are sneakily winning this draft, and we're not. they have more picks after this to talk about today. We're not done with them yet. They have two more picks after this. So... Uh, the Broncos just continue to do themselves well, fit, getting a position of need here and a really talented player in Harrison. Pick 84, Troy Dye, linebacker, Oregon to the Rams. I'm a Ducks fan. I love Troy Dye. Such a good player. This man played the last four games with a pretty gruesome injury. I forget what it was. Saw it on Twitter the other day. But the Rams need linebackers. Troy uh, Dye can step right in and be a starter. Corey Littleton's going to ask for a big payday, and I don't think the Rams are going to do that. They could look at edge here, but I think they're going to go with linebacker instead. It still works. Pick 85, Jeremy Chin, safety, Southern Illinois to the Eagles. Another small school safety who's really good. Chin is a phenomenal playmaker. This man can get turnovers left and right, and the Eagles, who are in need of another safety, with Malcolm Jenkins holding out until he gets a new contract. Rodney McLeod is a free agent. I think this is a great pick for the Eagles, and I think he'll shine right away. Pick 86, Darnay Holmes, cornerback UCLA to the Buffalo Bills. Uh, I think this is a good pick for them. They could use some more help in the secondary. Tredavious White is about to get a massive payday, and he deserves to. But I think they could use some more corners around him. Pick 87, K.J. Hill, wide receiver, Ohio State to the Patriots. They need wide receivers kind of badly. Uh, Nikhil Harry has a ton of potential. Julian Edelman, I think, is still good. But adding another guy in K.J. Hill, who's a very good route runner, doesn't possess the athletic tools to be elite, but I think he fits this Patriot system pretty well. And I think he could be a really, really good player and make an immediate impact to the offense. And then pick 88. This was from the C.J. Henderson-Patrick Queen trade in the first round. Jacksonville is going to take Clyde Edwards-Hilaire running back out of LSU. A little bit of a surprise pick here, but Leonard Fournette's a free agent. I don't know how much the Jaguars want to bring him back. He had a great year last year, but he has been suspended numerous times. He's been inconsistent at times. And I think going running back actually makes some sense for the Jags. So getting another LSU guy in that backfield in Clyde Edwards Hilaire, I think actually makes a ton of sense for Jacksonville. So this will not be a bad pick for them at all. And it's good value too. 88 for Clyde is a steal. Now on to the final eight picks, starting with the Minnesota Vikings. They're going to go with interior defensive lineman Lakeith O'Toole out of Utah. The Vikings need some help there. Linval Joseph's kind of getting older, so I think they could use a replacement, and O2 could be a very good one. Pick 90, Jordan Brooks, linebacker, Texas Tech, to the Cleveland Browns. He ran a really nice 40 time. I think it was sub 4-4-5. Four, four, and Joe Scobert looks like he's as good as gone. Not saying the Browns should let Joe Scobert go, but it sounds like they will. So they're going to need to replace him, and I think Brooks could be a pretty good one. Pick 91. Ladies and gentlemen, the Raiders have come away with another steal. Natane Muti, interior offensive lineman out of Fresno State. In my opinion, Muti is a borderline first-round prospect. Coming off a good combine where he benched like 44 reps or something, he put up historic numbers at the bench press, one of the top five or ten in recent memory. And he's a really, really good football player. He's my interior offensive lineman number two. He was my second-ranked interior offensive lineman before the combine, just behind Cesar Ruiz. And the fact that the Raiders get him almost in the fourth round is just unbelievable 
to me. I mean, the medical concerns are there with Natana Muti, but on the field, kid's an absolute stud. And if, it, if there were no medical concerns, he'd probably be the first interior offensive lineman off the board. And I don't even think his medical concerns are really warranting him to fall this far. I think part of it's also domino effect. So Raiders get themselves a stud. Pick 92, Jonathan Grenard, edge rusher, Florida. That is how you uh, say his name, by the way. As for Ravens, they're going to need to get themselves an edge rusher to replace Matt Judon. I'm not as high on Grenard as others, but I do still think he is a good prospect. And this will be a nice pick for them. Pick number 93, Adam Trotman, tight end from Dayton to the Titans. Seems like they've liked those two tight end sets, and Delaney Walker was kind of getting older. Jody Smith is solid, but not great. I think having a pairing of Smith and Trotman could be very good, and eventually Trotman can develop into the main tight end role. Pick 94, this is part of the Jalen Rager trade, so it now goes to the Denver Broncos. They're going to select Solomon Kinley, interior offensive lineman from Georgia. Broncos could use some help both at tackle and at the interior offensive line, so I think this can be a nice pick for them. He can slide in and play one of the guard spots for them. Pick 95, Devin Duvernay, wide receiver, Texas. You got your two outside receivers in Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy. Now you need a slot receiver, and Duvernay is a good short route runner. Had a nice 40 time, and he's been really good for Texas. And I've always had him as like a second or third round guy, but a lot of people had him as a day three player. But after a good showing at the combine, I think he will go in that uh, late part of day two. And this is a really nice pick for the Broncos, who, as I said earlier, are having an excellent draft. Jerry Judy, Bryce Hall, uh, Malik Harrison, Solomon Kinley, and Devin Duvernay in the top 100. That's an excellent draft for them. And then pick 96, Bradley A.N.A., Ed Drusher, Utah to the Chiefs. The final pick of the day is a pretty darn good one. A.N.A. is coming off a good senior ball and solid combine. And A.N.A. is a very, very good player. The size of the frame is a little bit concerning. But other than that, I mean, this is a steal. Excellent value pick. Excellent way to finish off the mock draft as the Chiefs can get themselves another uh, talented pass rusher in the mix. So, yeah, that'll end this mock draft. I hope you guys enjoyed. This one was a little bit longer than pretty much all my other mocks. This one ended up being over an hour. If you made it all the way through, you're a real one. And as always, have a good one. Peace out.